Hi there, I'm Christine, and this is the Canadian Constitution Foundation's Freedom Update. Today was the third day of hearings in the Public Order Emergency Commission, also known as the Rouleau Commission. This is the legally required public inquiry into the federal government's first ever invocation of the Emergencies Act, which was in response to the 2022 Freedom Convoy. The commission is examining and assessing the federal government's decision to declare an emergency. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick summary of some of the things that stood out to me in day three of these historic hearings. During this hearing, there were two witnesses, Ottawa City Manager Steve Kalanakis and Chief of Staff to Ottawa Mayor Serge Arpin. I can't wait to tell you all about it. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Christine and I'm the litigation director for the Canadian Constitution Foundation, a Canadian legal charity that fights for fundamental freedoms. I upload regular videos about our ongoing cases and about other interesting developments in constitutional law in Canada. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please hit like and subscribe below. It really helps my videos out a lot. Also, please remember that my videos are not legal advice. If you have your own legal question or problem, please consult your own lawyer. So today there were just two witnesses and both were from the city of Ottawa. Before getting into what happened, this is just my summary of some of the key parts of the full day of hearings that stood out to me as especially interesting. This is not a complete summary of everything that happened. And also please keep in mind that unless I tell you otherwise, this is just a summary. It's not necessarily my opinion of the testimony or evidence. Although so at some points I may actually give you my opinion, I'm always gonna tell you that I'm doing that, that I'm giving you my opinion. Also, this is just my best recollection of what happened based on my observations and notes. I recommend watching the hearings themselves or reading the transcripts if you want the full context and every detail. So let's get to what happened. The first witness was Ottawa City Manager, a man named Steve Kalanakis who is sometimes referred to in these commissions and in the evidence as Steve K. Now, there were a few things that really stood out to me about Mr. Kalanakis' testimony. Early on in his testimony, he talked about when the protests began. He talked about a letter they'd received from an Ottawa Hotel Industry Association. And in that letter, they'd expressed concerns to the city that they knew, the hotels knew, that the truckers were planning on staying 30 to 90 days or longer. Now the city communicated this to Ottawa police, but the police still prepared on the basis that the protest would just last for the first weekend and basically be done by Wednesday. Mr. Kalanakis has also testified that there was some disagreement about whether the police had actually instructed bylaw enforcement not to enforce parking and other bylaw infractions, but also about how whether even, even if they hadn't been instructed, whether or not that instruction took place, which shouldn't actually take place, whether or not that happened, he said that bylaw officers wouldn't actually even be able to properly enforce bylaws if the police were not supportive. However, he did say that some light vehicles at the beginning were ticketed and towed, in particular when those light vehicles, like uh, pickup trucks, when they were blocking emergency lanes. Later on in his testimony, it was revealed on cross-examination that 3,182 parking-related bylaw tickets were issued, and that in the city's application for an injunction, they said that over 2,000 bylaw tickets had been issued. There was also a long discussion in his testimony about the city looking for heavy vehicle tow trucks that could be used to remove the convoy trucks. He talked about how OC Transpo actually had in their own possession two heavy vehicle tow trucks but that they didn't want to use them for a number of reasons, including fear for the driver's safety if they were to try to tow trucks in an area of the city that police had not secured. Mr. Kalanakis also gave evidence about work the city had done to secure other heavy vehicle tow trucks, including uh, with towing companies that the city had standing contracts with. He said that neither the city nor the Ottawa police were able to find any towing companies willing to tow the convoy vehicles. The reasons he gave for that were things like tow companies being concerned about the safety of their drivers, about damage to the tow vehicles, their business relationships with trucking companies who 
they depend on that that relationship could be compromised if they towed the convoy vehicles and that some of the tow truck drivers actually supported the cause of the protest. Mr. Kalanakis also testified that ultimately heavy vehicle tow trucks were obtained because of the Emergencies Act. Now, I wanna interject here with my opinion. Now, while it is true that the Emergencies Act gave police the power to commandeer tow trucks, they actually already had the power to get access to towing trucks under existing law, including in parts of the criminal code. So the legal threshold to invoke the Emergencies Act is that there's no other law available to deal with a situation that's critical, urgent, and temporary, and national in scope. Uh, and if there's existing laws that can be used to get access to those tow trucks, it means that that threshold wasn't met. Now back to the evidence. So on cross-examination, Mr. Kalanak has also testified that while not having access to the heavy vehicle tow trucks was a problem, there was also a lack of an integrated plan in how to actually use those tow trucks once they were obtained. Mr. Kalanak has also testified about coordination between the Ottawa police, the province, and the federal government. He talked about how the province viewed the protests as a law enforcement issue and that it was not proper for elected officials to be involved in these sort of uh, three-party meetings that were taking place. So they wanted to, the province wanted to leave this to police as they saw it as a policing issue. Mr. Kalanakis also testified about a disagreement between the Ottawa police, the OPP and the RCMP over the number of resources that had been deployed. This ended up being a major theme of the day. It was a theme in Mr. Kalanakis' testimony and in the second witness, Mr. Arpen's testimony. Mr. Kalanakis testified that the OPP and RCMP both disagreed with the Ottawa police's assessment of how many officers had been deployed. On cross-examination, Mr. Kalanakis said that the Ontario Solicitor General, Sylvia Jones, said 1,500 OPP officers had been deployed, and he said that there was no way that this could have been accurate, and that he had no idea how to reconcile these numbers. Mr. Kalanakis also talked about discussions with the province to impose penalties on the protest vehicles, insurance, or vehicle regist commercial vehicle registrations, but ultimately the province didn't do this, and he has no information about why or what happened to that proposal. Mr. Kalanakis also gave a lot of testimony about negotiations between a group of protesters and this city. He testified that this group of protesters wanted to meet the mayor because in his words, no other elected government officials would meet with them and they wanted to create some pressure, in his opinion, to get others to meet with them. He gave testimony about negotiations with those protesters to move their vehicles, specifically onto Wellington Street, Wellington Street was chosen because protest leaders thought that there was no other place to put the trucks. If the city wanted to get the trucks out of the residential neighborhoods, Wellington was an option, although Mr. Kal Kalanakis testified that it couldn't accommodate all of them. So they discussed moving some of the other trucks to Arn Prior or other areas. They also had a logistical meeting with the protesters and police superintendent Drummond about this on February 13th, just the day before the Emergencies Act was invoked. Ultimately, the plan to move the trucks to Wellington Street fell apart. Basically on cross-examination, Mr. Kalanakis testified that the plan was blocked by Parliamentary Protective Services or by the Ottawa police. He said that the protesters he'd been negotiating with, uh, Keith Wilson in that case, he was negotiating in good faith and Mr. Kalanakis testified that the protesters tried to move their trucks onto Wellington but the Ottawa police or the Parliamentary Protective Services blocked them because at that point, the Emergencies Act had been invoked. Mr. Kanalakis also gave testimony about the mayor's decision to invoke a municipal state of emergency. And he testified that it was invoked to put pressure on the province to get them more resources and also for the province to, to create pressure for the province to declare their own state of emergency, which they actually did a few days later. The next witness was Serge Arpin, the chief of staff for the Ottawa mayor. Mr. Arpin spent a lot of time in his testimony talking about the negotiations between the city and a group of protesters who he described as, to quote him, brought a broad, moderate faction of the protesters. Now, in his private capacity as a, as a private citizen, Dean French, who was the former uh, chief of staff to the premier in Ontario, he was also working to negotiate with these protesters. 
Mr. Arpen talked about how they at the city had nothing to lose by trying to get the trucks to move out of the residential areas cooperatively. Like Mr. Canalacos, Mr. Arpen expressed a lot of frustration with the other levels of government. One of the most striking pieces of evidence was when Federal Minister Marco Mendocino's chief of staff, a man named Mike Jones, encouraged the city by text message, uh, a text exchange with Mr. Arpen, to meet with protesters. Mr. Arpan wrote back to Mike Jones in what I would say is spectacular fashion. He wrote, I assume you must understand how spectacularly ridiculous the contention is that we could be meeting with them, the protesters, when your level of government trots out a number of ministers to denigrate, denigrate the protesters and let them know that dialogue is impossible with the government of Canada in the context of a demonstration targeting the government of Canada. But somehow we, Ottawa, should divine that we should meet with them and make them feel heard. That's nauseating to say the least, but thanks for frank sharing, frankly. Mr. Arpin also testified at length about frustrations with the discrepancy between the number of RCMP officers they were being told was being deployed to Ottawa and the number that Ottawa Police Services said was actually sent. He testified that the mayor was initially hesitant to ask federal and provincial governments for more resources, but ultimately he did because the Ottawa police said they were unsuccessful in getting those other resources themselves. Mr. Arpin testified that never before um, had this mayor of Ottawa made a request for more police officers but ultimately he did this because the chair of Ottawa police said they wouldn't get more without the mayor getting involved. So the mayor sent these letters to the federal and provincial governments. Mr. Arpan testified that the city also wrote to the prime minister's office about this. And it, this was for two main reasons. First, because of the discrepancy between what they were being told was being sent to them from the RCMP and what Ottawa police were actually seeing. And second, because of what Mr. Arpin described as friendly fire from the federal government, from federal politicians, who he said were saying the protesters are up to the city to deal with. Mr. Arpin described this and these discrepancies as finger pointings, finger pointing, especially since the public was also being told about these additional RCMP resources that were being uh, deployed, but actually weren't being deployed. Mr. Arpin was in communication, as I said, with Minister Mendocino's office about this discrepancy, in particular with uh, Mike Jones. And Minister Mendocino's office had promised the mayor 250 RCMP officers. Mr. Arpan testified that he was told by Ottawa police that far fewer de were deployed and that most were actually being used to protect federal assets. When Mr. Arpan followed up with Mr. Jones of Minister Mendocino's office, Mr. Jones said that the RCMP, that the RCMP had told them uh, at the minister's office that they'd deployed three shifts of 70 officers each. Mr. Arpin replied to quote, they are lying to you flat out. Mr. Arpin testified he was never able to reconcile the number of officers he was told were being sent and the actual number that Ottawa police said were being sent. And he said he was extremely frustrated. Mr. Arpin also testified that there was no integrated planning structure after two weeks of protests, and this seemed to be holding things up a lot. By February 13th, Chief Slowly was able to confirm other resources, but Mr. Arpin said he didn't know when these resources actually started coming through because now the city at that point was focused on negotiating with the protesters to move those trucks onto Wellington Street. When a large influx of resources came on February 16th, after the declaration of the state of emergency, Mr. Arpan said that he didn't know what changed or if it was actually attributable to the federal government's use of the Emergencies Act. On cross, Mr. Arpan was asked about the plan to move those trucks onto Wellington Street, that negotiated plan with the broad, moderate faction of the protesters. And in a February 13th text exchange between Mr. Arpan and Mike Jones of Minister Mendocino's office. Now this was the day before the Emergencies Act was invoked. Mike Jones confirmed that Minister Mendocino was aware of those city negotiations with protesters to move the trucks onto Wellington. When asked on cross-examination 
if it was the police that stopped the trucks from ultimately moving on to Wellington Street, Mr. Arpen said that the authorities wanted to see the impact of the Emergencies Act, but he had no indication that those protesters were going to renege on their agreement to move the trucks if they hadn't been stopped. Mr. Arpan also testified about calls with the provincial government, including with Ontario Premier Ford's chief of staff. He testified that after the city had declared a state of emergency, they sent a letter to the province the next day, and he also called the premier's chief of staff. And that the Premier's Chief of Staff told him that he'd relayed the city's request for more resources to the OPP and that the Premier was supportive of that. He also testified that the province was concerned about giving the city more resources under the, to quote, current leadership structure, but that the Chief of Staff didn't elaborate on what he meant by that. So Mr. Arpin testified that he took this to be uh, general concerns about Chief Slowly but he said that the city of Ottawa did not share those concerns. So that's the summary of the evidence that stood out to me and really caught my attention. Now, what is my opinion of all of this? Keep in mind that the most important question for this inquiry is whether the legal threshold was met. The commission needs to decide if there was a critical situation that was urgent, temporary, and national in scope that could not be dealt with under any other law of Canada. The evidence presented today sounded a lot to me like there was a bureaucratic, uh, logistical, and operational mess in Ottawa, that the federal, provincial, and municipal governments were not cooperating effectively and pointing fingers at each other for political reasons. No one could even agree on how many police were actually deployed across the different forces. The legal threshold to invoke a public order emergency under the Emergencies Act, the statutory threshold, it's very high. Mismanagement and practical challenges, that is not the threshold. Indeed, the federal government seemed to just ignore the fact that there was a breakthrough about to happen with the movement of trucks onto this smaller footprint on Wellington and off of the residential streets. Because in my opinion, they'd already made the political decision to invoke the Emergencies Act and didn't feel like waiting to see what these negotiations actually brought. I hope that this summary was informative and useful for you. I'm gonna keep doing my best to continue posting video summaries of the hearings, but today's hearing again went on from 9.30 in the morning until about seven o'clock at night. So I'm only gonna be able to do these summaries as my regular workflow permits. After all, we are a party to this inquiry but we are gonna be cross-examining a witness on day four of the hearings, that's tomorrow. So I do hope to get another video to you summarizing that. You can also stay up to date by subscribing to this channel and by subscribing to our email freedom updates at the ccf.ca slash freedom updates. I also wanna thank all of you who are helping us participate in this inquiry by donating to support our legal fees, which are extremely <laughs> expensive in this case. So if you wanna support our work, we would so appreciate if you could make a donation at the ccf.ca slash donate. But if you can't, honestly, I totally get it. You can also just like and share this video because our YouTube is monetized. So we do get a little bit of ad revenue from just people like you watching the video. So thanks for making it this far. Okay, that's all for this update. Thanks for watching and let's keep fighting for freedom in Canada.